state basically that what you're asking is the question that basically there's always a chance that states that are not so common get undersampled. Yes. If they get undersampled, then I would underestimate their entropy. It comes together. If I sample enough with the right force field, then I should be able to get that those states. So for sure I'm missing here, but I also maybe move missing states into the barrier. That's why set, that's why basically if you look most of the force fields, even on good simulations, the error bars on the barriers are going to be much larger. They're going to be much larger because they are under sample. So basically, to count states on the barriers are very complicated. For one simulation at constant temperature in a potential like that, I'm going to spend most of the time here and most of the time here, and very rarely I'm going to jump over. So if I do that very rarely, only those rare events give me information about the barrier. So there's a good chance that unless I find ways of improving sampling there, that I'm going to do lots of mistakes in there. But that's how, so sampling and getting the proper entropy, they come together. And uh, there are other kinds of entropy that can come off that would be from the water, but at least from, from the protein, that's, that's where the problem comes from. Yes, <coughs> Um, yeah, I was curious about this graph too. Uh, I was wondering how well, it seems to be stable by about 16 kcal per mole, how well that uh, agreed with experimental values? First of all, it's not stable by 16 kcal per mole because you really think about no protein leaves there. Protein is going to leave more or less around, you get about 8 kilocalories in real in reading practice, right? Because that's where you fold the base and it's and that's where you're full of base. So we put real data here. The real experiments in this protein is about five or six kilocalories per mole. Yeah, and, but, but these states here, they come to 16 up, like 16 blue here. You never see a protein there. You never, for example, that's a clear indication that you never see a protein that extent. Right, that's why the energy is too high. So now you can get probably the occupation. This one, like I told you, is something like that, right? So you don't even see full occupation, all of it. But if you really look, when you plot the state, you come, if you plot one dimension, you'll have something like that. Okay, and also, um, you created the initial uh, conditions for this by unfolding the protein. I was wondering yeah. how well that trajectory um, agreed with folding pro or folding trajectories from uh, go. Okay, bottom. first of all, there's no guarantee they agree, and probably no, they agree. probably won't. Okay, but. they they, pro they probably won't, but that shouldn't be a problem if I properly sampled, because that's a, no, no, they're yeah, right. Right. That's right. So what I'm telling you is, in principle, if I'm going to sample a landscape, and I'm not doing the kinetics, I'm just doing sampling to get free energy profiles. If I properly sample, then there is no problem. Or you're absolutely correct is that basically, every time you run just what you once said, like I told you, there's a good chance that you don't properly sample. Right, basically, if you start from folding runs like we did, there's a good chance that you're properly folding areas around the native basin. We are not properly folding areas around the folded basin or even on the barrier, like she was pointing out a little bit ago. That's correct. But, uh, but in principle, if I had an infinite amount of time, that should be fine, right? If I had an infinite amount of time, I could start from a folded state and just wait. And if I wait long enough, I will do that. The problem is not in practice, but your point is well taken. So, it, so the bottom line is, in practice, you go out to the old computers, tough. Basically, most of the people that uh, make conclusions about landscape coming from unfolding runs, this is not this one, because unfolding runs have to do it, but you, you normally tend to underestimate all these effects that you have. All the sort of geometrical traps and all these things, they never appear on an unfolding run, right? So, so you, you, you sort of tend to underestimate. If the system was nice, soft, and smooth, that would be fine, but that's far from reality. Thank you. Let's take a break, otherwise. Oh, okay, well, I'm supposed to actually, we're going to do the break. Uh, oh, you're talking now? Yeah, I'm supposed to start. Go for it. Sure, <laughs> John. Do you need my computer or going to just. No, I got it. I can see that for a minute.
right, so um, in this wrap up today, what I wanted to cover were a few things. Uh, first of all, just a comment that grew out of the discussion yesterday. Uh, comment on uh, the persistence length of amyloids, which is relevant to these, this annulus formation. Um, and then um, a little bit more discussion about this uh, this fibro model we have because it is illuminating towards some aspects of amyloids that I think are uh, potentially uh, important both technologically and biologically. Um, then this um, organizing principle three for toxicity, which is about uh, the role that the aggregates can play in disrupting cell signaling networks. And that will lead me to a little bit of an aside about some numbers on cell signaling networks. And then finally, uh, I'll close with some what I think are some interesting open questions that perhaps people in here might be interested in exploring. OK, so uh, first of all, on this, uh, well, let me make sure that it, uh, oops, I should uh, get my computer left here first. Oh, right. Let's see if I was going to read the persistence of the comment first. Persistence length. There is a, uh, a reference which uh, there's, there's a number of measurements of persistence lengths for amyloids. Here's a reference that I looked up between yesterday and today. So um, remind you that what persistence length is for a polymer. That if you have a, a polymer and you find the tangent vector at position. R1 along the polymer. You want to measure the correlation of that with the tangent vector at position R2 along the polymer. So if you measure thermodynamically average correlation function, if the polymer is very long and stiff, then this will be one for the entire length of the polymer. Of course, that never happens. But what this will be is basically e to the distance divided by the persistence length. So it measures how bendable the polymer is. And uh, the persistence length for DNA, for example, is about um, 50 nanometers. Um, so that means that on a 50 nanometer scale, it's very hard to bend DNA. It tends to stay straight on a 50 nanometer scale. And in fact, you can connect it to the strain energy, so if you write down a, a, a strain energy for bending it, then that will be equal to the integral over the actual arc length times uh, du ds, where u is the displacement vector, times the strain modulus. So u is the displacement vector uh, between two points along the, the polymer. And then you'll have that the, uh, the persistence length is basically the strain modulus divided by KBT. So the stiffer, that makes sense, the stiffer the, uh, the polymer, the higher the strain modulus, the harder it is to bend it and the longer the persistence length. Uh, so uh, for a particular amyloid formed from the protein uh, APOC2, uh, Chris Dobson's lab, this is a paper by D.M. Uh, Hatters in Biophysical Journal. There must be a bigger piece of chalk in here. Let's see. Uh, Biophysical Journal. Eighty-five, three nine seven nine. 2003. So for APO, 
uh, C3, the persistence length is about 30, what is it? It's about 36 nanometers. Now, this is representative of the typical amyloid fiber world. And indeed, when you form these annuluses with a 2 nanometer inside diameter and a 15 nanometer outside diameter, there's going to be considerable strain energy associated with that. So that's one of the costs of making these, these annuluses that can form the pores. Uh, so this was just a leftover piece of discussion from, from, from yesterday. Um, OK, now I want to go back uh, for a minute to the, to the fiber model that, uh, that we have worked on which was to try to explain this spiral data on uh, PRP. Um, and you may recall that uh, we made these separate beta helices out of the C-terminus and the N-terminus. The N-terminal model was already proposed by the prisoner lab, uh, prisoner Cohen's labs before. Uh, some version of this was already proposed, and then we're proposing this. Uh, and then we can build these tinker toy models by taking and domain swapping each, again, each one of these is color coded, so we can build tetramers. Uh, the, the tetramers are such that there are 12 beta strands, which is 60 angstroms, which is the size of the repeat unit on the, uh, on the fibril itself. And that these three over here were consistent with the, uh, the data. Um, and that they have these domain swaps in between, which explains the thick region in the middle of the electron microscopy. They have beta uh, cross beta structure along these filaments on either side, and then we uh, link to the units by domain swapping between the N-terminals with a short linker of five amino acids. This linker is about 20 amino acids going across here. We have a five amino acid linker going across here. Now, um, uh, one thing to keep in mind, uh, I'll just mention this a little bit, is there could be some biological relevance to this viral. I'll just mention this, that in this particular model, uh, the methionine at 129 contacts the aspartic acid at 178. So just keep that in your mind for a minute, and we'll come back to that. But uh, one thing you can do is, is uh, here we're proposing a model, so we should check the stability of the model. And uh, let's see, uh, Kay Kuhn's uh, basically compared, for example, the C-terminal beta helix in black here, this is the RMSD, with all at, all at amber simulations, uh, with uh, no beta helices off of the protein database. Most of them are clustered down here, but there's a couple of those beta helices from the pro protein database which go up here. And so the point is, uh, this is pretty flat. This is uh, 1,500 picoseconds, but we've also run it up to longer times now, basically up to 10 nanoseconds. And the story is the same. Uh, let's see here. The blue one, focus on the blue one. That's the C-terminal Beta helix, again, when you compare it to things from the protein database, it's in the same ballpark and it seems to be relatively stable uh, out to the 10 nanosecond uh, scale. Okay. So now back to this point that for this model, M129 contacts D178. I already talked in the context of this uh, kinetic um, control of prion disease that this, the mutation at, uh, uh, the point mutation at 178 is uh, what gives rise to fatal familial insomnia. That's all you need, except you need uh, the finding 129. Uh, now, remember that every person has two copies of their chromosome, one from the father and one from the mother. And it turns out that in people of European ancestry, that it's about 50 50 methionine 129 and valine at 129, which is an interesting observation. On the other hand, if you're coming from China or Japan, then you're about 100%, well, high 90% um, methionine 129. And if you look at all the other mammals, when you line up the sequence for this particular residue, it's methionine at this particular amino acid position. So it's pretty interesting that this amino acid uh, right here is necessary for the fatal familial insomnia to work. That is to say, oops, that is to say you need uh, this amino acid 50 residues away from this position where you have the mutation of aspartic acid to asparagine in order to get this to work. What we were fascinated by is that in this particular fiber model, you can get these things to sit right next to each other. So it suggests the possibility of a me mechanistic interaction between the methionine and the, uh, the uh, mutation. And just to give you an idea of what we're wanting to explore, and this is part of Sunny Dye's uh, work, uh, is um, we're, so we, what we do is we assume basically that the c terminal beta helix can be stabilized under some conditions, uh, basically conditions of low pH that the c terminal beta helix can be stabilized. 
and hypothesized then that the C terminal beta helix can play the role of the chaperone that we talked about the other day. Let's see, um, the person who asked the question about the chaperone. Mary, there you are. I didn't see Mary. Right, that there's a self-chaperoning, if you will, or a self-templating by the, by the prion itself, and it comes from this possibility of converting the alpha helices to beta helices. So that's something we want to explore. But if you look at the wild type, you have this methionine come in here, and it could potentially be a hydrogen bond between the sulfur on the methionine and an amide on this histidine. But that would be pH dependent because of the histidine. Uh, on the other hand, if the, in the FFI case, you could potentially hydrogen bond the methionine sulfur to both the histidine and to the uh, asparagine over here, the amide group over on the asparagine. So you have the possibility of gaining an extra hydrogen bond in the, in the process. What's interesting is also this story right here. In, in the case of mad cow in England, they, uh, the, the, the tainted protein product was fed not only to cattle, it was fed to all, all the other animals too. It was fed to dogs, it was fed to cats, it was fed to zoo animals. Uh, the zoo animals, by and large, got sick. Uh, uh, it was fed to mink, the mink got sick. Um, house cats and big cats got sick. Antelope got sick. Deer did not get sick. Pigs did not get sick. And dogs did not get sick. And if you look at dogs, one interesting thing about dogs is that right in this place, instead of a histidine, there's an arginine. And if you check out the rotamers, that is the orientations of the side chains, to try to arrange for the possibility of hydrogen bonding with the methionine, it's much harder with the arginine than it is with the histidine. So we're trying to explore these three cases as basically examples of intermediates where the templating occurs when this region of the N terminus couples to the C terminus uh, over here, and this templating can play a role in the conversion process of the prion disease. But this points to the, to the importance of um, potential pH dependence. And you can see that on these uh, C terminal beta helical models. These are different threads of the beta helix. We always put these cysteines on the corners of the beta helix, which is a constraint. Uh, but there's, a, there, there's a, two reasons to explore these different threads where we align the sequence onto the structure slightly differently. One is that the prion protein um, can be uh, diglycosylated, two sugars attached, to these in-linked asparagines. Uh, it can be monoglycosylated or it can be unglycosylated. And so the strains, as I mentioned before, pick out different levels of sugars. So you can actually look at the structure with different threads you can arrange to make the asparagines all both point out, which could allow for a strain that would select for diclycosylated um, um, uh, prion protein. One where just one of the asparagines points out, which will allow for monoglycosylated and one for unglycosylated. The other point is that there are these glutamic acids, which I've shown in red here. And it's very hard on any thread to arrange for the glutamic acids to both point, uh, to, to always point out. So that means that to stabilize the thread, you may have to actually have um, low pH, which would protonate the glutamic acid and avoid the charge cost of burying the glutamic acid inside of the uh, the um, beta helix. Okay, and um, let's see, actually there was another picture. I wanted to show you this. There is some evidence that there's some interesting things going on, in fact, with the prion from uh, thermal measurements. These are heat capacity measurements. Uh, this is at an intermediate pH of 4.5 to 5 uh, for the prion protein, and you see a single transition between the unfolded state at high temperatures and the folded state at low temperatures. But if you go at a pH that is a little bit lower or a pH that's a little bit higher, you actually see evidence for uh, some kind of an intermediate for the sheet prion protein. So that you see two peaks in the heat capacity. Then if you sit in this region for a while, you find that it's irreversible, which means that you're forming some kind of uh, aggregate which presumably pre uh, precipitates out of the solution. So uh, there is already evidence from heat capacity data that there, are, there is a possibility of a pH dependent uh, intermediate transition. It, on the high end, it presumably has something to do with uh, protonating the histidines. On the low end, it presumably has something to do with protonating the acids in the, uh, uh, in the prion protein. Okay, so now uh, that's a little bit of commentary on the, the pH dependence. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Now I want to talk about these pictures uh, to set up organizing principle three for toxicity. That is that when you aggregate, you may very well lose whatever the special function is of these amyloid proteins in the normal state. When you aggregate, you can lose that function. And these are two sets of experiments which point towards interesting loss of function associated with prion protein. The first one is shown in these columns. I'll have to explain them to you. They're probably a little hard to read, but I'll have to explain them to you. These are some experiments done with yeast prion protein 
uh, sorry, not with yeast parent protein. This experiment is done on yeast by David Harris's lab at, at Washington University. What they did was they, they took uh, yeast and they, they had it express both the mammalian Bax protein, which when the mammalian Bax protein is expressed at high levels, you get apoptosis. Um, they then would put in, uh, uh, so these are colonies of yeast, three different runs. Oh, I've got to do something about that. These are three different colonies of yeast uh, diluted from left to right. Uh, okay, so they're diluted as you go this direction. They have fourfold dilutions between each column. The rows represent three different runs. What happens here is you've got the, uh, the backs grown on a glucose growth medium. Here it's grown on a galactose growth medium. There is a, uh, a VAX promoter, which is not sensitive to glucose, but the VAX promoter is sensitive to galactose. So in other words, if you grow it on glucose, basically the VAX promoter is shut off. If you grow it on galactose, the VAX promoter is turned on. And then you, you wind up basically depleting the cells from apoptosis, uh, going from left to right. Here, you put in a VAX inhibitor. And the VAX inhibitor uh, on the glucose medium doesn't do anything. But on the galactose medium, it tends to suppress this cell death caused by Vax. Now in this one, what was done was they have not only the Vax expressed, but they have mammalian prion protein expressed. When the mammalian prion protein is expressed in the galactose growth medium, which will turn on the Vax inhibitor, then what happens is basically the prion rescues the yeast cells from apoptosis by Vax. So the prion interacts in some way with the Vax protein. Where they sit in the cell is completely different. So the, it's not a direct coupling between the Vax protein and the prion where they sit in the cell is completely different. But what this, whoops, what this shows is that uh, the prion, in fact, is more effective at uh, suppressing the effects of the Vax, which causes apoptosis, than the Vax inhibitor is. And this, this is showing without either the prion or the Vax, but having, uh, in, the, in the galactose medium, having the, the, uh, the Vax promoter present. And you kill all the cells at, at long enough times. If you have the Vax inhibitor, you don't kill all the cells, but you do, do an even better job with the prion. They also then did studies where they delete regions of the prion, and they find out that uh, it's associated with um, the end of the prion, which is a signaling complex on the end terminus that gets deleted as the prion is sent out to the surface of the cell. If you delete that from the gene, from the prion gene, you basically will suppress the uh, ability of the prion to, to uh, stop the Vax from doing its job. And then they also study different point mutations over here. The point mutations basically have no effect but if you have a mutation where you add extra uh, copies of these so-called oct repeats to the prion in the internal region, that actually uh, loses the, the Vax effect. OK, uh, now there's one other uh, loss of, so the, the suggestion here then is that we, if you get prion aggregation, you can lose the ability of the prion to interact with Vax and suppress apoptosis. Um, here, is a different set of measurements. These are measurements done on cultured nerve cells by Sylvan Lehman's group. Um, on these, these two plots right here, the cells are normal. They're not infected with prion disease. Here, these cells are infected with prion disease. And what one finds is that the copper uptake of these cells is suppressed by an order of magnitude. The prion protein binds copper. It holds uh, up to five coppers. But uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is that if you calculate the amount of prion protein that can be present in a cell, and you ask how much of the copper of the cell could be associated with it, it's less than a percent. It's not a big player in copper transport at all in the cells. And yet, if by infection, if by aggregation, you um, uh, uh, change the, the, the properties of the prion, apparently there's some network that the prion participates in which tells the cells to stop taking up copper. And obviously, if you stop taking up copper, eventually the cell will, will die because you're not supplying copper to some of the crucial proteins like uh, cytochrome oxidase uh, needed for respiration. So these are just two examples of a, the third organizing principle that when you have the aggregation, you have a loss of, uh, of function, um, which in a way is coupled to the ubiquitin one that we mentioned yesterday. But these are some specific losses of function associated with signaling uh, networks. So uh, that leads me to the point I wanted to make right here which is to have a little bit of, uh, of a digression on, on some of the um, uh, gross aspects of protein networks. Uh, Daniel, of course, already talked some about this. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the statistics uh, of the networks and, and point to why uh, the biological networks involving proteins might have the, the structure that they do. So this is a somewhat of a digression from the amyloid business, which has been the main focus of what I've been talking about. 
but I thought it was uh, worth, worth doing. So, um, as we heard from Daniel, the, the proteins can participate both in regulatory networks and they can participate in protein-protein uh, interaction networks. And this is an interesting uh, uh, plot uh, from uh, Stover et al. in 2000. Um, so this is a plot of the percent of regulatory proteins in prokaryotes uh, plotted versus the, the total number of genes in the prokaryotes. This is about 5,000. This is about 15% right here. So the percentage of proteins which are involved in some kind of regula regulation of other proteins. Um, and then this is a straight line. And the data for these uh, bacteria, for these prokaryotes, the data just sort of clusters around this straight line. So actually, I'll make the, the dashes bigger. And the points represent the data. They sort of cluster right around that straight line. So if you think about that a little bit, given that this is a linear relation between the percentage of regulatory proteins plotted essentially versus the total number of proteins, the number of genes, that tells you that the number of regulatory proteins goes like in square. Um, on the other hand, if you were to do the same thing for eukaryotes, sorry, this is the total number of proteins that are expressed in the total number of genes. If you do the same thing for eukaryotes, this goes like in proteins, the total number of proteins, to the 1.3. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Why would eukaryotes be so different than prokaryotes, first of all? That's an interesting question. I think just a curiosity. Is there a number for plants much more different than animals? Uh, that I don't know. I just know this is some sort of gross number for all eukaryotes. So the, the biggest interesting thing is that it's so different than, than, than prokaryotes. That's, yeah, I don't know for sure about plants. Yeah. Um, let's see. It didn't have to be this way. Just to give you some other examples. Uh, if you, well, let me think about it in terms of a matrix, first of all. So if you plot um, a, a, an interaction matrix for regulation, So you have all proteins listed up here, all proteins for a particular organism listed here. That implies that for bacteria, or for prokaryotes, that this is densely, that this interaction matrix is densely filled, right? That there certainly will be some zeros in there because you only have about 15% for the biggest uh, genome of a bacteria, only about 15%. But that it is densely filled for bacteria, and it's it's also in some sense densely filled for uh, for eukaryotes, but it's densely filled in a more interesting way. There's sort of a fractal character to the fall off away from the diagonal here for eukaryotes. But it, it didn't have to be this way, right? I mean, suppose that you had a completely modular network. If you had a completely modular network without a lot of connectivity uh, of of between the proteins. Then you have um, sort of, if you draw one of these interaction networks like Daniel drew the other day, you have sort of these isolated nodes. And the kind of matrix structure that that would give you is a banded matrix structure. I mean, there could be a little bit of wiggle here, but there'd be a banded matrix structure. And a banded matrix structure here will grow linearly with the number of proteins. So it tells you, obviously, that uh, these things aren't simply modular. They're highly connected, which we know about, for example, from the picture that Daniel showed us. They're extremely highly connected networks. And in addition, um, uh, they're, 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 not, they're, not, certainly not, uh, they're certainly not modular. But well, basically, that's, I mean, that's the interesting thing. They're, they're highly connected. I mean, there's some other possibilities you could consider. But it tells you something interesting about the way that, that life is organized. Um, OK, now, if you talk about uh, these networks, another thing you can characterize is the distribution. And this is a typical thing that's done in network theory. So you can talk about the distribution. Uh, so this is the, uh, the coordination number in a protein network. 
So it's the number of links to other proteins from a given protein. So if you draw the, uh, the individual proteins as nodes in the network, this is counting the average, the number of links from a particular one, and then this is the distribution of links. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, this has a so-called scale-free behavior. That is, it's a power law in the coordination number. Uh, where there's a different power law, apparently, for protein-protein interaction networks. Then there is for protein regulatory networks. So the power law is about 1.5, plus or minus 0.5, for regulatory networks. But uh, such scale-free networks uh, are of considerable interest. Other examples of scale-free networks are the internet. Um, and uh, let's see, of course, there's scale-free networks in the, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, or the six degrees of, I guess there's also what the, uh, who is the famous uh, Hungarian mathematician, the Erdős Index, right? So you can, you can uh, I don't know if there's enough mathematicians to, to get completely scale-free on that. But there are other scale-free networks out there the internet has pretty much the same exponent as this. And the networks also depend, some networks have directed nodes. For example, enzyme, if you think about enzymes, they can have directed nodes because uh, they can point in one way and not point back the other way. So you can have a different exponent for uh, uh, inward pointing links and outward pointing links as well. But it's, it's just interesting to, to note this. And then you can talk about um, amplification in the network. So you can define an amplification factor which is going to be the, the mean over the nodes of the inward pointing coordination number times the outward pointing coordination number divided by the mean inward pointing coordination number. And um, this will be a function of the inward pointing coordination number. But if you assume that it's weakly correlated to the inward pointing coordination number, then this will just, you can just drop that functional dependence and go like this right here. Okay, uh, this is ignoring, uh, this definition of the amplification is ignoring correlations with the neighbors. And this is, uh, um, this is assuming that QN and QR are uncorrelated. Okay, so um, if you one one uh, limit of this amplification factor is if you take a uh, undirected random net, just to give a feeling for this amplification factor. If you have an undirected random net, then A is equal to uh, Q times Q minus 1 divided by Q, so that the amplification is basically Q minus 1. That tells you, not surprisingly, that if you have, uh, you know, when you have a link that has, your, the, the, the Q minus 1 is you have to subtract off, you have to decide which link you count is coming in, and you have to subtract that off. Okay, so you only count the ones that you're not considering to be coming in. So if you, if you think about that, that's kind of interesting because uh, uh, that gives you some intuition that obviously amplification means you have to have at least two coming out uh, for one coming in. And on average, as long as you have more than one coming out, then you're in good shape to get some amplification. Okay, uh, now, so I, I guess the, the fact that these are scale-free and the fact that there's amplification gives you two ideas of why biology would pick these things. Uh, and if you go back to this prion point, uh, there's clearly some amplification going on in this picture right here. Uh, because the prion only holds about one, less than 1% one of the copper in the cell. So in order for it to shut down the copper production in the cell, there has to be some amplification of the signal that the prion is losing its ability to bind the copper. And so amplification can be an important aspect for uh, cell networks. Small input signals are then amplified to, to give large modifications potentially inside the cell. 
And the other point about the scale-free properties, if the, if the network is scale-free, it makes it less sensitive. If you lose one particular node, then because you've got all these other ones that are connected and, and have overlapping functions, you're not going to necessarily disrupt the network. And that's true, for example, of the internet. The fact that there's amplification of the internet is, is clearly true for anybody who's tried to do Google bombing. Um, you can certainly get amplification in the network. The, the fact that there is uh, uh, Scale-free behavior in the network means if you lose one internet site, then you know presumably there's uh, there's other ones you don't you don't disrupt the internet. But the one problem for the internet is that if you send in a bad signal through the internet, like a virus, the amplification means that you're quickly going to um, have problems throughout the internet. Okay, uh, let's see. Did I want to say anything else about this? Um, just that you can if you take a scale-free network, you can work out the amplification. Uh, in a couple of cases here, um, let's see. So in the case of the scale-free, which I'll just do right here, the amplification is going to be the integral from 1 to the total number of nodes, dq, q squared over q to the gamma. This is assuming uh, a uh, undirected network, and uh, we ignore the correlations between uh, the incoming and outgoing. So this is q squared divided by q to the gamma over the integral from 1 to n dq q over q to the gamma. And that's equal to uh, 1 over, uh, sorry, that's equal to uh, 2 minus gamma divided by 3 minus gamma um, times n the 3 minus gamma. At least if you have uh, 2 less than gamma less than three, which is the case for the protein-protein interaction network and for the, uh, the internet. Okay, uh, so it, you get some interesting amplifications that can be uh, growing within if you are uh, in, in this region. And also, in fact, if gamma is less than two, you also can get big amplifications that grow within. Whereas the amplifications lose this large-scale dependence on the, the network once the scale-free exponent gets bigger than three. And if you're interested in more, there's a very good review article by one of the sort of kings of network theory, Rossi, in Rep Mod Phys from 2001. Uh, he, in particular, with Albert, was able to come up with a model for growth of a network that could give you the scale-free behavior with an exponent of three, precisely three. Okay, so uh, I, I, in the last few minutes, I just want to show you a few more. I want to step back to the to the protein aggregation problem and show you a few more interesting things uh, about amyloids. One is that for some organisms, amyloids can actually be good. Um, and here are two examples uh, right here. Uh, the first one is uh, curly. These are these protein tendrils that come off of E. coli or salmonella. And uh, these protein tendrils come out in times of stress when the bacteria may want to form colonies, come together to uh, protect against stress. And in the first stage of colony formation, apparently they sort of connect to each other with a combination of cellulose and uh, the curly fibrils. Um, okay, so they, they, they connect to each other with a combination of the cellulose and the curly fibrils. Uh, this is another uh, example of amyloid, spider cell. Now, there's not just one kind of spider cell. For different spiders, there's up to six different kinds of spider cell. And there's two main differences in spider cell. There's the spider silk that makes up the, the web that catches the insects, and there's the spider silk that the spider itself uses to sort of move around. And the spider silk that this, the spider itself hangs on to to move around has a tensile strength which is better than steel. It turns out that the main proteins involved in spider silk are amyloid proteins. And about 25% of, uh, of the protein involved in the spider silk that the spider itself hangs on to is of amyloid structure. It's been studied with crystallography and it's of amyloid structure. And then about 75% of it is actually some uh, random loops. So somehow the mechanical properties of spider silk are uh, composite mechanical properties associated with these amyloid crystals hooked together through these protein loops, these random protein loops. Uh, the pH control that I alluded to in the prion case seems to come in in the spider silk. When the spider ejects the proteins first from, its, uh, from the orify that produced the glands that produced this, that spider silk comes in first uh, without amyloid structure. Then it comes downstream, gets a little uh, jolt of acid pH conditions, lowers the pH to about, I think, 5.5 or 6. And under those acidic conditions, you actually form the amyloid uh, uh, 
crystal and the, the amyloid parts of the spider silk. So the amyloid is not the whole story on the spider silk, but the amyloid is a big part of the story on the spider silk. And how the spider silk uh, mechanically works is still an open question. Um, and, and actually, the full function of these curly and the, the full behavior of these curly is, is an open question as well. For example, there are actually two different proteins involved in the formation of the curly, both of which have amyloid properties. But only one of them forms the main constituent of the curly. Uh, the other one, uh, geez, the other one sits on the surface and templates the growth of the the, the rest of the fibrils. So there's a, another interesting templating problem for growth of, of amyloid fibrils on the surface of these bacteria. Um, there are also other interesting suggestions out there. We've already heard about yeast and how non-Mendelian heredity can be conferred in yeast. Uh, Eric Kandel and Susan Lindquist, along with their student C, uh, came up with another intriguing idea. Can prions be involved in memory? Uh, Kandel has uh, spent a lot of time working on the C slug, Ecclesia, and the neurons of the C slug. Kandel is also a Nobel laureate. Um, and this protein, which lives on the surface of the C slug, is believed to be involved in the molecular basis for uh, uh, synaptic plasticity for memory of the sea slug. Um, now, what they did was they took this protein and they expressed it in yeast, and they found that the protein CPEV expressed in yeast actually has a prion property, just like uh, the, the native prion proteins of yeast. So uh, their suggestion is that perhaps if you could find a way to reversibly go between the sort of one bad conformation, if you will, of the prion and the good conformation, that that could give you sort of a one and zero for a molecular basis of memory. Uh, it's a long ways to go from showing that it is uh, giving you a prion in yeast to, to showing you this, but it is an interesting uh, suggestion. Let me uh, show you something else on amyloids that's just come up recently, and some of you may have seen this. Um, let me see here. Yes. So um, it turns out that there is a protein which is expressed in semen. Um, there's a protein which is expressed in semen which binds the HIV virus. And it in, apparently increases the efficacy of HIV infection dramatically. So this just came out in Cell in December. And uh, I, can, I can give the reference to anybody who's interested. But this is showing you um, uh, injections into uh, rats, lab rats, without the uh, of AIDS without the, uh, this protein present that is amyloidogenic, this is showing you the uh, in injection into rats with a protein present, which is amyloidogenic. And you can see that the infection rates of the lab rats have gone up dramatically. So apparently, this amyloid protein provides, uh, interacts with the AIDS virus and provides some kind of scaffolding, which allows the AIDS virus to stick around longer and thereby increase the infectivity. And this could have certainly public health significance um, uh, and explain partly why uh, there seems to be this greater transmission from men to women than the other way around. Uh, and so this is an area that, that is unexplored uh, as well, apart from these initial studies. Uh, for example, no one knows at all what model to make for, for the fibrils of this, this protein fragment. Okay, so I wanted to just leave you with a, a few of these interesting questions. I'm sure we'll find more amyloid diseases associated with these proteins. I'm sure as, as people keep looking, we'll find more examples of actual functionality or uh, surprising dysfunctionality associated with these amyloid proteins. But uh, hopefully, at least from these lectures, you've gotten some, uh, some ideas about um, how this all works. And maybe I'll just throw it open for, for some questions.
Let me find the, the uh, network paper. Uh, Okay, I'll, I'll have to find the, uh, the RMP paper, and uh, it's, I, I know it's uh, Barabasi 2001. Oh, yeah, I'll have to find the RMP paper. For some reason, I just didn't pull it up quickly on the search here, but I'll, I'll try to find that for you uh, in, the, in the break. Any other questions? Okay, well, we go to the break early. Thanks. days at the hotel that are not being picked up by the conference. If they are associated with the um, your airline travel, in other words, it, it's not just that you want to hang out in Rio for a couple of extra days, we'll happily uh, reimburse you, so make sure that you keep your receipt for that. There was apparently some misunderstanding with the hotel desk that the charge would be uh, $400 a night. It won't be. You can get the same rate, uh, um, I'm assured by Lisa, of $145 a night. So if there's any confusion about that, please talk to Lisa. But we will reimburse you for any extra nights you have associated with the, the travel to or from Rio in order to get the less expensive air tickets, okay? Any other questions about that aspect or, or the logistics of the meeting before we move on? Okay, then uh, we'll start this second session for today with another uh, in the series by Daniel Schultz, followed by Jerson uh, Silva after that. Go ahead.
But before they make that commitment, this formulation, there's a window in which some of the cells show this uh, competence behavior. Um, the competence is regulated by this uh, by one protein, by this one master regulation uh, regulator. That's a stain in this case over here with the uh, with the red fluorescent protein. So this this uh, red cells are the are the competent cells, and you can see that only a few of them do that. Uh, I'm going to tell you why. Um, so the cells that go into competence, they go into competence mm -hmm. for a while, and then they come back to the vegetative state, and they are free to. Um, go to sporulation if they, if they want to. Um, there's a... Let's do it. Well, talk about, well, okay. We're going to talk more about what competence actually is in the next slide, but competence is a state where the cell can uh, <coughs> basically uh, absorb uh, DNA from the knee, any kind of DNA. Um, and they have a lot of... Huh? Yeah, and that's why not all cells go into competence. When, when the cell goes into competence, basically what, what it does also uh, expresses some uh, antibiotics that kills other cells around and eat their DNA. Um, that can serve as food or it's like a sex cycle before they go into sporulation. And that's why you can't have all cells doing that. Right? So only a, only a few of the cells do that. And this is an isogenic population. So all cells have the same DNA. And only a few of them do that. So that's why uh, this, uh, this depends on fluctuations inside the cell. And that's why this is really interesting. Uh, and this is a, this is a movie of uh, yeah, some drones. Some of them go into sporulation. And one of them decides to be competent. Then it comes back from competence and then divides and then goes back into the the the, the vegetative state, which is the, these dark ones. Daniel, show exactly what is new. Well, the one that goes into competence is the the colorful one, yeah. and then it comes back from competence. And you can see this, and it goes back to the dark. The divide, right? Uh, and when it comes back, it's back to vegetative state, and it can divide. Um, okay, so uh, all, all these cells have the same DNA as a, as a genetic population, and still, like only five to ten percent maximum under under uh, perfect conditions, only five to ten percent of the cells go into competence. Then uh, these cells uh, kill other cells around and eat their DNA. Right? Uh, so, so this really stresses the importance of, of, of noise and fluctuations in this in this process. Um, because uh, since they're all in the same DNA and they all have the same DNA, this uh, this can only uh, arise from uh, fluctuation in the cell components associated with this. Uh, so okay, so it, it, this uh, this this there's this one uh, master regula uh, regulatory protein uh, for competence, and this protein is expressed. It, uh, it activates all these uh, lots of genes uh, that uh, change a lot of a lot of things inside the cell that uh, make the cell able to uh, to absorb its DNA. Uh, so it happens uh, under high uh, high cell densities and limited nutrient condition, and it's uh, it, it's connected to to quorum sensing mechanism uh, and this. Uh, it, it, has a people believe that has major the purpose of uh, increasing the the, the genome and uh, acquiring new characteristics and kind of like a sex cycle before they before they go into fertilization. They they don't know what the conditions are going to be when the when the spore comes back to life. Uh, okay, so how does the cell make this decision? This uh, COMK is the, is the master regulatory protein involved in this. And uh, this, uh, the gene that expresses COMK 
is regulated by a, like, I, I think people have discovered already, like, seven different proteins that can, uh, that can uh, change the, the expression of this one. Seven binding sites on transcription factors for this uh, cocaine. But there's been studies that, uh, where people mutated all of this, mutated out all of these binding sites except for the one of concave cells. So concave uh, stimulates it, uh, it itself, right? So if it's kept at uh, low concentrations, uh, then the cell doesn't go into competence, but then if, if you cross a certain threshold, then it self-activates and this uh, the concentration of it blows up and then the cell goes into competence. Um, so usually this uh, the concentration of cocaine is kept low by this uh, by this degradation complex. It's a, it's a complex of uh, a bunch of proteins that uh, has the function of Degrading, some of the degrading these targets, and it can keep, keep it there. And that happens really fast, so it keeps the uh, concentration of those proteins down. Uh, so this over here is degrading concave really fast, uh, and it doesn't allow the, the level of concave to, to, to go up. Um, but then, uh, how does the concave uh, cross this threshold to, to, to self activate and go into concave? This is a this is other uh, protein involved in, uh, in this. this is called S. It's actually a very small. It's a, it's a small peptide actually, and and this is in the same promoter of, of this um, this, uh, this uh, the same promoter that uh, activates the expression of this S here also activates the uh, expression of a surfactant, which is the antibiotic that I can kill other cells around and. Uh, and this protein from S is also degraded by the same uh, degradation complex over there. So, how the, uh, so uh, when this protein is uh, expressed at, at, at higher levels, it takes up a lot of the degradation complex there. It uses the degradation complex and allows the concave level to go up a bit and maybe cross that threshold that will uh, allow it to. Uh, to Start self activation and go into competence. And then, uh, then uh, how does it exit competence? There's uh, some studies that suggest that uh, there's, a, there's a negative regulation of, of COMAS by COMK. But this is not direct, there's no binding to this over here, and it's a, it's a controversial study. Apparently, the, the, apparently you, you do get a, a negative regulation of. Of Congress by Congress, and that, that might be uh, that might be useful for uh, coming back from from competence. Um, okay, so these are the two genes that are involved in the decision of going into competence <coughs> or not. Um, so this is uh, this is how we're gonna model this this, this system. Um, the K and S are the concentrations of K and K and S. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna make a distinction here uh, between a bound and an unbound promoter of of, of K. And and these uh, over here are the the, the degradation complex. So this one is free. It's bound to a K. -K Molecular one is bound to a comas. So, so again, single tissue has a K1 is unbound? Yeah, uh, one is unbound and, uh, and zero is bound. The thing is different from yesterday. This is self activation, right? So the bound is the high synthesis rate. Yeah. So we're going to consider here the. Then, yes. are, are, uh, The, the promoter, the promoter is the, the piece of DNA that's uh, right before the, the gene, and that's where the RNA, RNA polymerase binds and starts transcribing the gene. And that also
also around there is the binding site for the protein that's going to uh, recruit uh, RNA polymerase and increase the rate of, of which the gene is transcribed. Yeah? It's the it's the binding site. It's the binding site. Uh, Just out of curiosity, here, so that's where you're getting confused. There is a gene and there is a protein. The rectangles are the gene. The balls are the proteins on the representation. That's where you're getting confused. So there's a gene. So every gene, there's a gene is where the protein uh, is produced. Yeah. The promoter area is where you decide the protein is produced or not, and that's where you have to bind RNA polymerase. There are two so, ways you can act. When you have a repressor, you have a protein that binds the place where polymerase is going to bind, so it's unable to bind. When you have an activator, it's a protein that binds just like before and uses to work as an attractor to make it easier for polymerase to bind. Yeah. A genus transcriber and RNA polymerase binds there and start, starts transcribing the thing. Right? And, uh, so, and you can have different affinities over there, so that can um, happen if you know, easier or not. Uh, and then a repressor can have a binding site for a protein and a bind where the RNA polymerase should bind. So that's going to not let the RNA polymerase bind there. That's going to avoid the transcription. Or, such as in this case, there's an activator where the protein uh, binds next to the, to the binding site of the RNA polymerase and has like, some positive interactions with the RNA polymerase. So it'll actually recruit the RNA polymerase. So yeah, the promoter being having that protein there is going to help recruit RNA polymerase. That's the bound uh, in this case, and, and, and when it's free, it's not uh, about yeah. Okay. So so yeah, uh, here uh, is a, a bound, a bound, is a bind. Okay, we'll consider the binding and binding over here. Then both the bound and the unbound, uh, the unbound and the bound um, promoters are going to have a different synthesis rate. So this is going to be a, the, the basal one, the small one, which is called the basal one. 